Chapter Ten of John Stuart Mill: His Life and Works. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Stuart Mill: His Life and Works. His Influence as a Practical Politician by Millicent Garrett Fawcett. Every one must be familiar with the often expressed opinion that. As a practical politician, Mr. Mill's career was essentially a failure. It has been said a thousand times that the principal result of his brief representation of Westminster was to furnish an additional proof, if one were wanted, that a philosopher is totally incapable of exercising any useful influence in the direction of practical politics. It is proposed briefly to examine this opinion, though it may indeed with truth be urged that the present time is not calculated to make the examination an impartial one. The inquiry involves an almost constant reference, either expressed or implied, to Mr. Mill's personal character and influence, and it is hardly possible for those who are mourning him as a friend to speak of these dispassionately. It is perhaps hardly necessary at such a time as this to ask the indulgence of the reader if this unworthy tribute to the memory of a great man is colored by personal reverence and gratitude. When, it is said that Mr. Mill failed as a practical politician, there are two questions to be asked. Who says he has failed? And what is it said that he failed in? Now, it seems that the persons who are loudest in the assertion of his failure are precisely those to whom the reforms advocated by Mr. Mill in his writings are distasteful. They are those who pronounce all schemes of electoral reform, embodying the principle of proportional representation, to be the result of a conspiracy of fools and rogues. They are those who sneer at the fanciful rights of women. They are those who think our present land tenure eminently calculated to make the rich contented, and keep the poor in their proper places. They are those who believe that republicans and atheists ought to be treated like vermin and exterminated accordingly. They are those who think that all must be well with England if her imports and exports are increasing, and that we are justified in repudiating our foreign engagements, if to maintain them would have an injurious effect upon trade. The assertion of failure coming from such persons does not mean that Mr. Mill failed to promote the practical success of those objects the advocacy of which forms the chief feature of his political writings. It is rather a measure of his success in promoting these objects, and of the disgust with which his success is regarded by those who are opposed to his political ideas. It was known, or ought to have been known, by every one who supported Mr. Mill's candidature in 1865, that he was a powerful advocate of proportional representation, and that he attributed the very greatest importance to the political, industrial, and social emancipation of women. He advocated years ago, in his political economy, the scheme of land tenure reform with which his name is now practically associated. His essay on liberty left no doubt as to his opinions upon the value of maintaining freedom of thought and speech. His article entitled A Few Words on Non-Intervention might have warned the partisans of the Manchester School that he had no sympathy with their views on foreign policy. There is little doubt that the majority of Mr. Mill's supporters in 1865 did not know what his political opinions were, and that they voted for him simply on his reputation as a great thinker. A large number, however, probably supported him, knowing in a general way the views advocated in his writings, but thinking that he would probably be like many other politicians, and not allow his practice to be in the least degree influenced by his theories. Just as radical heirs apparent are said to lay aside all inconvenient revolutionary opinions when they come to the throne, it was believed that Mr. Mill in Parliament would be an entirely different person from Mr. Mill in his study. It was one thing to write an essay in favor of proportional representation. It was another thing to assist in the insertion of the principle of proportional representation in the Reform Bill and to form a school of practical politicians who took care to ensure the adoption of this principle in the school board elections. It was one thing to advocate theoretically the claims of women to representation. It was another to introduce the subject into the House of Commons, to promote an active political organization in its favor, and thus to convert it from a philosophical dream into a question of pressing and practical 
importance. It was one thing to advocate freedom of thought and discussion in all political and religious questions. It was another to speak respectfully of Mr. Odger, and to send Mr. Bradlaugh a contribution toward the expenses of his candidature for Northampton. The discovery that Mr. Mill's chief objects in Parliament were the same as his chief objects out of Parliament, branded him at once as an unpractical man, and his success in promoting these objects constituted his failure as a politician. His fearless disregard of unpopularity, as manifested in his prosecution, in conjunction with Mr. P. A. Taylor of ex-Governor Eyer, was another proof that he was entirely unlike the people who called themselves practical politicians. His persistency in conducting this prosecution was one of the main causes of his defeat at the election of 1868. If to be unpopular because he promoted the practical success of the opinions his life had been spent in advocating is to have failed, then Mr. Mill failed. If, however, the success of a politician is to be measured by the degree in which he is able personally to influence the course of politics, and attach to himself a school of political thought, then Mr. Mill, in the best meaning of the words, has succeeded. If Mr. Mill had died ten years ago, is it probable that his views on representative reform would have received so much practical recognition as they have obtained during the last five years? If he had never entered the House of Commons, would the women's suffrage question be where it is now? Before he introduced the subject into the House of Commons in 1867, it may be said to have had no political existence in this country. The whole question was held in such contempt by practical politicians, that the House would probably have refused to listen to any member, except Mr. Mill, who advocated the removal of the political disabilities of women. Mr. Mill was the one member of Parliament whose high intellectual position enabled him to raise the question without being laughed down as a fool. To everyone's astonishment, seventy-four members followed Mr. Mill into the lobby. The most sanguine estimate previous to the division of the number of his supporters had been thirty. Since that time, the movement in favor of women's suffrage has made rapid and steady progress. Like all genuine political movements, it has borne fruit in many measures which are intended to remove the grievances of which those who advocate the movement complain. Among these collateral results of the agitation for women's suffrage may be enumerated the Married Women's Property Act, the Custody of Infants Bill, and the admission of women to the municipal and educational franchises and to seats upon school boards. A large part of the present anxiety to improve the education of girls and women is also due to the conviction that the political disabilities of women will not be maintained. In this question of the general improvement of the position of women, Mr. Mill's influence can scarcely be overestimated. All through his life he regarded it as a question of first-rate importance, and the extent to which he was able practically to promote it is sufficient in itself to make his career as a politician a success. A strong proof of the vitality of the movement, of which he was the principal originator, is that his death cannot injuriously affect its activity or its prospects of ultimate success. What he has done for women is final. He gave to their service the best powers of his mind and the best years of his life. His death consecrates the gift. It can never lessen its value. What is true of Mr. Mill's influence on the women's suffrage question is true also of the other political movements in which he took an active interest. He was able in all of these powerfully to influence the political history of his day and in the direction in which he desired to influence it. If this is failure, failure is worth much more than success. Of the influence of Mr. Mill's personal character on those who were his political associates, it is difficult to speak too warmly. No one could be with him or work with him without being conscious of breathing a purer moral atmosphere. He made mean personal ambitions and rivalries seem despicable and ridiculous, not so much by anything that he said directly on the subject, as by contrast with his own noble, strong, and generous nature. It is almost impossible to imagine that any one could be so insensible to the high morality of Mr. Mill's character as to suggest to him any course of conduct that was not entirely upright and consistent. 
A year or two ago, however, a story was told of a gentleman who asked Mr. Mill to stand for an Irish constituency, and stated that the only opinion it would be necessary for him to change was the one he had so often expressed against denominational education. A smile at the man's stupidity, and the remark, I should like to have seen Mill's face when he heard this suggestion, is the almost invariable comment on this story. It is a very suggestive indication of the impression Mr. Mill's moral influence made on those who knew him. An apology is due to the readers of these pages that the task of speaking of Mr. Mill as a practical politician has not fallen into more competent hands. No one can be more deeply sensible of my inability to deal adequately with the subject than I am myself. This sketch ought to have been written by one who is in every way more qualified to speak of Mr. Mill's political career than I am. Unavoidable circumstances, however, prevented his undertaking the work, and as the time was too short to allow of any being spent in a search that might have proved fruitless, the honor of writing these lines has devolved upon me. End of chapter 10 Recording by Bill Borst